Okay, welcome everyone. Let's talk a little bit about emergency airway management for the out-of-hospital provider. Let's take a look at some of the really critical pieces that we have to have foundationally in order for us to be successful in airway management. So we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy. We'll talk a little bit about the physiology of oxygenation and ventilation. I think that'll better help you understand the key things that we do. We'll talk a little bit about patient positioning and the importance of patient positioning for successful intubation and airway management. That's going to be a really, really important piece to all of this, and it's going to be different than what you're used to seeing in the field. So we're going to also talk a little bit about less is more here. There's a tremendous amount of literature that suggests that, in fact, bag valve mask ventilation and oxygenation is the better way to go in the out-of-hospital setting, and that folks that are intubated in the out-of-hospital setting tend to have poorer outcomes. So I'll let you read some of that literature as well. We'll, uh, we'll explore that a little bit differently. We're going to also talk about the importance of predicting difficult intubation or difficult bag valve mass technique. It's important for you to know ahead of time that you're going to have difficulty performing a procedure so that you can anticipate having to implement plan B and plan C and that you can properly tailor each of those plans ahead of time and you can get your equipment out and get ready and have the personnel necessary to be able to be successful. We'll talk a little bit about anticipating the patient's clinical course. Sometimes the patient's going to be awake, alert, and oriented, but you know that their clinical course is going to uh, tell a different story in the near term, and sometimes we'll have to do aggressive airway management for those folks. I'll provide you with some algorithms to follow. These are things that you can study and memorize at your leisure. We'll put those into practice in the clinical setting as well as the classroom setting with task trainers and simulation. It's really important for you to build muscle memory to these algorithms. It's going to play an important role in your ability to be successful more often than not. And then, of course, we'll talk a lot about the equipment itself. One of the things that I've seen over the years with folks that are not successful with airway management is that they have a lack of understanding of how the equipment fits together and how it works and the intended use of that equipment. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. All right, so let's jump right into the anatomy. Um, hopefully you can review this particular slide on your own. I just want you to see that, of course, the respiratory system, when we talk about that, we're talking about it in, uh, in terms of the nasopharynx and the oropharynx bringing air into the lungs by way of the trachea. So we talk about humidification and all of this stuff that happens at the nasopharynx level. That's to prepare that air for being just the right temperature and being the right humidity to be efficient and, uh, and effective once it gets down to the level of the lungs. All right, so we'll review some of the uh, some of the basics here. All right, so I, this is an overwhelming slide. I don't want you to go and memorize all these things. Uh, most of them you probably already know anyway, but I don't want you to be overwhelmed. What I want you to see here, there's a couple take-home pieces. I want you to see that the oropharynx, that the oral cavity, uh, predominantly exists as an occupied space, and it's occupied by the tongue. So one of the things you're going to have to contend with when you're managing a patient's airway is the tongue. It's going to be in the way. Sometimes it's going to be inflamed. Sometimes it's going to be edematous. Um, so we'll talk about some different techniques that we can use to get around that. And then sometimes we'll say, hey, the best way to approach this is going to be bag valve mass technique. In fact, more often than not, it probably will be. So a couple things I do want you to know about. I want you to know about the tongue, and I want you to be able to, uh, in your mind's eye, visualize where the tongue sits in the oral cavity. I also want you to know about the molecular space or the molecula that sits right at the root of the tongue, so that would be another important thing for you to know. The epiglottis is the little flap of cartilage that sits uh, at the root of the tongue, and when you swallow, it is the, the piece of the body that's responsible for closing off this glottic opening and uh, enabling food and water or whatever you're, you're ingesting to travel in the, um, in the esophageal uh, region, so in the esophagus down to the stomach. So the trachea, as you see, is wide open because it's got cartilage rings, and we'll see that in the anatomy lab. We'll also see that with the pig pluck lab that we do at the academy. Um, the esophagus is squished down because it doesn't have cartilage rings. It's a muscular stru structure, and it's closed unless it's in use. All right, so those are important things I want you to know. I also want you to know about the hard palate. That's what separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. I want you to see that the soft palate is what eventually terminates um, the, uh, the hard palate component here. It ends in a soft area of tissue. This is also going to present some challenges sometimes. This will get in our way. 
And I also want you to recognize the fact that the, the nasopharynx and the hard palate are essentially at 90 degrees to the plane of the patient's face. So if you think about the patient's face as being this perfectly vertical line, if you look at the way the nasopharynx is created, it is a perfectly horizontal line. So it's essentially a 90 degree bend. And I want you to appreciate that because we stick things in people's noses such as NPAs and nasal tracheal tubes. And sometimes we have the desire to go up this way. We want to approach the patient's snare and move in an upward direction, and we never want to do that. We want to lift this little nostril right out of the way, the tip of the nose out of the way, and we want to insert things into the nose at a 90-degree angle to the patient's face because up here lies turbinates and a bunch of other very um, vascular structures. They're going to bleed if you touch them and if you poke at them, and then you have a bigger problem on your hands than if you had done nothing at all, which is bad. So we'll talk more about that as well. All right, I think that's enough for this slide. We'll uh, review some of the other co common components in just a little while. All right, this is just another slide to show you the breakdown or where we, um, where we break the different pieces of the, uh, of the res upper respiratory system. So when you look at this, we're talking about the nasopharynx. That is delineated by the hard palate. The oropharynx is hard palate to essentially the top of the epiglottis. And then the hypopharynx is epiglottis and all those parts inferiorly. All right, so important for you to know those demarcation points as well. All right, this is just another common piece that I want you to be familiar with. I want you to start looking inside people's mouths, ask them to stick their tongue out and say, ah, because it's important for you to recognize that we're sh we should be able to see in the majority of the population a number of key structures that are gonna play an important role in your success when you go to orally intubate these patients. So a couple of the structures of the hard palate followed by the soft palate posteriorly. And again, the soft palate terminates in the uvula. That's a little guy that dangles down. Uh, on the sides, you'll see the tonsils here. These are the guys here. Again, when there's infection there, that can present some challenges. Or if there are tumors there, that can present some challenges when it comes time to intubation. So when you look in somebody's mouth, you should have a clear view of the hypopharynx. You should be able to see the hard and soft palate and uvula. And if you look in a patient's mouth and they don't have those readily visible, you know you're going to have some challenges. So this slide and being able to recognize some of these components is important because it allows you to predict airway difficulty. It's going to allow you to tell whether or not you're probably going to be successful with your first pass attempt of an endotracheal tube, which is going to play an important role here in just a little while. All right, so this is the view that you're going to see. Obviously, this is just a cartoon. This is not flesh. But this is essentially the view that you'll want to see. This is the view that you want to create for yourself when you put your blade down into the patient's throat and you follow down to the root of the tongue. You'll see that a Macintosh blade, for example, will sit right in this little molecular space. And in fact, when you push away with that laryngoscope handle, a curved handle, you're going to actually take the tip of that handle and you want to sit right there on the glossoepiglottic fold and you're going to want to pull that out of the way so that the epiglottis also moves out of the way thereby making the glottic opening even bigger and more enlarged for you to be able to see. So the goal of direct laryngoscopy, the goal of intubation and view is to create yourself this wide open glottic opening so that you have the best chance at being able to place a tube right here. So I also want you to know that the vocal cords are here. Think about an upside down V shape. This is exactly what you're going to see when you are intubating a patient in the normal fashion. All right, and then you'll see there are some cartilages and some other things here. We'll talk about the arytenoid cartilages in just a little while when we look at a tube introducer, which is a device that we can use to facilitate intubation. We'll say that sometimes our tube may get stuck on some of these uh, arytenoid cartilages, and I'll show you a trick when we get to that so that you can see how we can pass the tube past those when we're using a bougie or a tube introducer. All right, so another cumbersome slide here. What I want you to see is that there's this common recurring theme, and that recurring theme is that wherever we have this little yellowish, orange, brown hash marks here, these are indicative of the vagus nerve and these little branches of vagus innervation. So when you look at that, wow, it's really all over the hypopharynx, it's on the epiglottis, it's in the molecular space. All that to say, it's important for us to know what the vagus nerve does at this level. And vagal stimulation here essentially causes bradycardia, which can lead to hypotension. 
So if we have a patient that we're intubating, we have to be real aware of the fact that any time we stimulate hypopharynx, epiglottis, molecular space, that we're going to be stimulating the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is parasympathetic. It's going to cause bradycardia. It's going to cause hypotension. These are things that are bad for us. So look at this slide. You don't have to know it. All the other pieces, I just want you to remember vagus nerve, and you're going to be stimulating that when you put things down into the patient's hypopharynx. All right, so this is my son. He's got a huge mouth. He was about eight when I took this picture. And I just want you to just look at this for a moment and see what parts you can identify. So if you want to pause the video for a second, that's great. Otherwise, I'm going to, uh, to ruin your fun here because I'm going to go forward. All right, so when we look here, we can, of course, see the tongue. And we can also see the tonsils. This is a tonsil that's right here. And also, we can see the hypopharynx. Right? And then there's this additional structure that's of importance here, this little guy right here. And hopefully you have figured out by now that this little structure, this little U-shaped structure that we see in our view, is actually the epiglottis. So I mentioned to you the importance of looking in a patient's mouth prior to intubation, and this is a great reason for doing that because when you look at this patient and you look at, at in the patient's mouth, when you see epiglottis, that tells you that should predict a little bit about uh, how difficult or how easy the patient is going to be to intubate or to manage their airway. All right, so anytime you get a patient and you say, you know, open your mouth, stick your tongue out, say ah, if they're still awake, all right, or if you look inside the patient's mouth and you have clear view of the soft palate and the tonsils and the uvula and you can see well into the hypopharynx, that's always a good predictor of ease of intubation. All right, so we'll come back to that in just a little while. All right, so we're going to take a little break here, and then we're going to come back and talk about physiology of breathing.